Okay, welcome back everybody. Let's send it to Ginesta for the second. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for being back. Um, yesterday we have uh, discussed um, homology and cohomology, and we have introduced the boundary matrices. And these boundary matrices, as long as the metric is uh, is flat, so there is no metric, no essential metric. We are only in the realm of topology and the scalar product between the, the co-chain is the L2 norm. Then this boundary matrix, they capture at the same time the boundary operator and the co-boundary operator and it's a joint. Okay, and we will discuss this, you know, we, we rush a little bit at the end of last um, lesson. We will come back to it when we will discuss the metric tomorrow. Today, uh, so the boundary matrices are these yes. beautiful, nice, but <coughs> rectangular matrices that project a signal, for instance, a signal on the node, they projected on the edges doing the gradient, or a signal on the edges, they projected on the triangle doing the curve. Okay? Today, we will discuss only square matrices. So we will go back to a nice framework and we will discuss in particular the Ogilaplacian first and the Dirac operator. Then. So the Ogilaplacian is used to describe diffusion, okay? higher order diffusion. So on, at the level of the graph, there is the graph Laplacian that describes the diffusion from node to node through edges. The higher order of Ogilaplacian, they describe diffusion from edge to edge through, um, and, and from edge to edge, for instance, and they go either through node or through triangle. So you can go either one dimension down or one dimension up. And so the Ogilaplacian are really fundamental to describe uh, dynamics of cochain and um, together with the boundary operators. And we will see that they, in, in, in the last lesson, that really they are important to describe uh, synchronization, for instance, of topological signals, global synchronization, and they are the discrete version of the Laplace Beltrami operator. Okay, so they are very useful. The second class of operator is more known to physicists than to topologists, is the Dirac operator. And it has been proposed originally by Kogut and Suskind in a particular variation. And the Dirac operator can be understood as the square root of the Laplacian. So if you do d square, you get a kind of Laplacian. And acts simultaneously on the topological signal. So it acts simultaneously on this. Uh, vector that is defined both on the node, on the edges, and on, on, the, on the triangle, for instance, if you are in two dimension. And the Dirac operator, of course, has a nice connection with theoretical physics, but is also very important and actually very useful in general for topology or for describing dynamics on uh, any spatial code. So this is the introduction, so let me just start with the Ogilaplacian. So, um, so while the Ogilaplacian describes only diffusion from n synthesis to n synthesis, the Dirac operator will describe diffusion across different dimensions. So not diffusion, like can treat the co-chain across different dimensions. Let, let me just start with the Ogilaplacian. Okay, so the Laplacian uh, actually are, are many, one for each order, one for each dimension of your simplicial complex. So if you have two dimensional simplicial complex, we have the zero Laplacian, one Laplacian, two Laplacian, right? And the n order Laplacian. Ln is defined as the sum 
between an operator Ln up plus Ln down, <coughs> where Ln up describes diffusion from M synthesis to M synthesis going one dimension up, and Ln down describes diffusion from M synthesis to M synthesis going one dimension down. So if you are on the edges, either you go through the node with L1 down or through the triangle with L1. Okay? And so L M up is equal, so you this is defined in terms of the co-boundary operator and it's adjoint. So is defined as the adjoint. So you first, so let's say that you are, um, uh, that m is equal to zero, uh, you first do the gradient and then you do the divergence. Okay, so this is the, the, the ln up. And then you have also ln down, which is defined as the M star. Okay. And of course, this is the fine for every M greater or equal than zero. So you start from nodes, also nodes, you can define the original Laplacian, which is the graph Laplacian, with the caveat that you define that L zero down. So if you are on the node, there is nothing one dimension down, so Lm down is zero. So if you are in, in matrix form, how do they look this? Um, so this display with diffusion, diffusion from M simplex and synthesis to and synthesis going through m plus one or m minus one synthesis. Why you cannot go farther than that? Why you cannot go two dimension? Because the boundary of the boundary is known, so you cannot concatenate two boundary operator because you, you know, three times because you. So, so you go only one dimension down and one dimension up because of this topological property. So, uh, you know, like in, in two dimension, two dimensional simplicial complex, you will have the graph Laplacian, which is only L0, L0 up. So this will be this thing here. So you do uh, the gradient and then the divergence. Then you will have L1, which is L1 up plus L1 down. So uh, L1 up has the same expression with B2. And L1 down, you go in this other way. Okay, so you have rectangular matrices. So from a rectangular matrices, by doing B1, B1 transpose, you get a square matrix of a one dimension. If you do the multiplication the other way around, you have a matrix, a square matrix of another dimension. So this uh, Lm are nm times nm matrices. So they are square matrices, node by node, edge by edge. And if you have two dimensions, you also have L2. So you go from triangle to triangle. And here B3 is not defined because there are no tetrahedra, so you only have B B2 transpose. Okay? But if you have three dimensions, of course, L2 will have the same expression and you go. Okay? So 
these are quite nice and neat and uh, so L0 of course play a special role and L0 is also known to be, so this expression here is the diagonal matrix of the degree minus the adjacency matrix. Okay. You can prove it. This is all unweighted for now. Okay. So what are the properties of this algebra function that are nice and neat and we really love and like? One thing is clear that uh, they are semi definite positive. Okay, so the first one is that L0, sorry, LLM, LM down and LM up are semi definite positive. If you don't already see this from the definition, we can define scalar product between a cochain, a n cochain, and uh, ln up, f, okay? So, if we do this, this is f, scalar product, uh, delta n plus one star, delta n plus one, F. You use the property of the adjoint, so you move this on the other side, removing the star, and clearly this is greater or equal than zero. And of course, you can do the same business with L and up, uh, L and down, so F. L and down F is equal to F delta M delta M star F. Now you do that joint of delta M, so you, you move it in the other side, putting a star. So And Lm is equal to Lm up plus Lm down. So it's the sum of two semi-definite positive matrix. So it's, uh... Okay, so of course you, you can see this also more, I don't know, in an applied way. So clearly the eigenvalue of L0 are the square of the singular value of the boundary operator. So, of course, this is positive definite and also, and so on. Okay? So, um, a very important property of the algebra function is algebra decomposition. That's really nice and neat if you uh, understand it. It's not very difficult to understand. But the odd uh, decomposition implies that, for instance, if you have a fund, uh, one cochain, a function defined on the edges, there is a unique way in which you can decompose this fun, this cochain, into a gradient flow, a solenoidal um, um, signal, and a harmonic signal. Okay, so. The gradient flow will be a function defined on the edge, which is the difference on each edge is the gradient of something defined on some node, or the potential. The solidonial will be um, the circuitation of something defined on the triangle, and the irrotational will be a signal that is harmonic. Okay? Um, so let, let's discuss how to decomposition. This is very powerful because it allows you to, to, to have a, not only as a nice continuous limit, of course, uh, the 
related to what happens in the continuous, but it's also very powerful because uh, you, you really have a feeling of, of this. Uh, it's a practically a spectral decomposition of the So let's see this, it's quite nice and neat. So let's do this multiplication. Okay. So now I uh, cancel the, the wrong board, but we, we should remember that LMAP. Okay, no, no, we can use this definition. We, we don't need the, the boundary match, so we can use this right directly. So we have delta n plus 1 star, delta n plus 1, this is ln up. Then we have ln down, okay? And what we see, so, okay, so this is, this is, L and up, this is L and down. But here we see that there is another structure emerging that is this multiplication here. And how much is this? The boundary of the boundary is no. So this is zero. This is zero. So when you multiply the two matrices, this is zero. The beautiful thing is that when you multiply the other way around, also you get zero. So you have and now these two are multiplied. So also this is zero. So for physicists which are very much concerned about this, how much is this? The commutator of LMA is identically zero. So you can diagonalize these two matrices uh, to simultaneously, but it's even more than that, because it's not only that you you can diagonalize the matrix simultaneously, but you have a structure of the eigenvector which is quite nice and neat. And this is that if you have an eigenvector of the Euler fashion uh, corresponding to non-zero eigenvalue, so a non-harmonic eigenvector. This is either a, a non-zero eigenvector of Elena or a non-zero eigenvector of Elena. Okay? Um, no, so, so why can't it be of both? Yeah, because, because of this property. Because practically, if, a, if something is a, in the image of Elena, it is in the kernel of Elena. So you have that from this property it follows that the image of Lm down is included in the kernel of Lm up. And here the image of Lm up is included in the kernel of Lm down. Let me reformat my question. I mean, two matrices can commute, but they might have one eigenvector in common, right? I don't see a contradiction if... Uh... They have all the eigenvectors in common, here. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you have all the eigenvectors in common, 
is, is, is this clear? Like from yes. from this, it follows that the image of Alan Down is in the kernel. If I no, no, it, uh, it's, it's clear. The formula wise, it's perfectly clear. Okay. I don't yeah. understand why is either. So an eigen uh, an eigen vector of Ln is either of L up or of L down and can be of both. That's no, it is, is either a non-zero eigen vector of Ln yeah. down. If it's a non-zero eigen vector right. of Ln down, is a zero eigen vector of Ln up. Ah, good. Okay, good. good. Fine, fine, fine. Then he is eigen vector of both, and is either zero or finite, but can only be finite of one of them. Yeah. Then, no, then I agree. Then I agree. Okay. Sorry. So it may. It may yeah, let, let me just maybe it's, it's, it, when you see this at the first time you, you don't understand very well what happened so maybe this is useful I don't know maybe it's not very very insightful uh, you don't find it typically in the paper in the paper but so if you have if you diagonalize this matrices right you have a basis in which you can simultaneously di diagonalize L and up L and down and L M. Okay. And how do they look these diagonalized matrices? In our case B dimensional. Here you have the eigenvector of the eigenvalue of L and up. Okay? Zero, zero. Here you have where this this is since the image of LM up is inside the kernel of LM down, here in this block you should have zero. And here you will have the eigen value of Uh, L and down, and a third block is the kernel, the intersection of the kernel mode. So, so in this case, is the eigenvector, the non-zero eigenvector, are either eigenvector of L and up. Or a vector of L and R. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the way you can you express this uh, mathematically is that you express this and you say the usual way in which you express how to decomposition is. This place of M cochain can be expressed as the direct sum of the image of delta M, the kernel of LM, and the image of delta star M. And um, the kernel of LM is in the intersection between the kernel of LM up and LM down. This means that if you have a M cochain, okay, if CM is an M cochain. You can write in a unique way, you can decompose in a unique way CM as the sum of a irrotational um, irrotational Um, 
Yeah, I hope I'm not messing up with the indices, but this is what I remember. Not, uh, 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 the, Some of it, irritational part, solidonial part, and the harmonic part. So, uh, something that is in the image of the M, something that is in the image of the M, and something that is in the So, from this, um, from this uh, property, there is a nice and neat property that relates the Laplacian, the spectrum of the Laplacian to topology. And this is a very celebrated property that is a, just a direct consequence of algebra decomposition and is used in many, many applications. And it, it consists of the fact that the dimension of the kernel of the M Laplacian is the M Betty number. So if you want to calculate the MBT number, you just diagonalize the Nautilus Laplacian and find the dimension of the curve. So uh, let's see this. This is another property connecting the Nautilus Laplacian to the Betty number. So that's the key property. So the Dimension <laughs> of the kernel of Lm is beta m, where beta m is the m Betty number. So, in other words, the dimension of the kernel of Lm. This is very well known, for instance, of graph, the dimension of the graph Laplacian, which coincides with the Auch Laplacian, is the number of connected components in the dimension of the curve. If you have the one Laplacian, it will be the number of one dimensional cycle. If you have a two dimensional two dimensional Laplacian, it will be the number of two dimensional cavity. And this is a, just a consequence of this is. Thanks to Alch decomposition. So, because you start with that, the dimension of the kernel of Lm is the dimension of the intersection of the kernel of Lm up and Lm down. Decomposition. You can look at that picture if you want to convince yourself. So this dimension, so the dimension of this block is the dimension of the kernel of L and up minus the dimension of the kernel of, of the image of lambda. And, and you see that radical no the dimension of the kernel of Elena, these two spaces is minus uh, the dimension of the image of lambda. And you can also write that the dimension of the kernel of Lm down minus the dimension of the image of Lm up. And you can continue with this.
this is to ensure that this is the dimension of delta uh, m uh, delta m star minus the dimension of the image of delta m star m, m plus one star. Uh, you can remember that this is the image of the boundary, you know, because uh, the matrix is uh, the same. And this is, by definition, the matching of okay, So this is the rank. Okay. So by dimension of DM star, do you mean dimension of kernel? Ah, uh, yes, kernel. Okay, perfect. So let me just um, tell you a little bit more about this. Laplace and some example. Um, so we have already expressed the, uh, the Auge Laplace in matrix form with the boundary matrices. There, um, there, there is another a fourth observation which is practically very useful also, is that uh, L M up and L M plus one down are isospectral. So if you consider the expression in terms of boundary matrices, you have that L M up is equal um, This, uh, sorry, like this, and L M plus one down is okay. so it's clear that although the matrices are different. Um, uh, dimension, because one is the dimension of LMM, LM, uh, number of M synthesis, the other is the dimension of number of M plus one synthesis, but the non zero eigenvalue are the same and are the square of the singular value of the boundary operator. So the non zero spectrum is the same, and what changes is only the, the dimension of the kernel. So, uh, for pro a fifth property that just very, could be very useful to kind of, you know, remember is uh, something, you know, so on a graph, on a graph or network, people always look only at the graph Laplace mostly. Not many people look at the one down Laplace, but it exists. So if you have only know the edges, you can go from node to node through edges, or from edges to edges to node. So you have L0, which is this object, and L1, which is only L1 down is this object. Okay? So here the dimension of the kernel is beta zero. Okay? So if you have a connected network graph 
connected, beta 0 measures the number of connected components, so this is 1, I. and the dimension of L1, so this, this is a matrix which is L0 by L0, right? If it's a connected graph, the non-zero eigenvalue are L0 minus 1, right? This is a matrix that is N1 by N1, the non-zero eigenvalue are the same, because we are just seeing that this is a spectral. So, the dimension of the kernel of L1 is the empty number beta 1, which we just prove is n1 minus n0 minus 1. Okay? Because n1 is the dimension of these matrices, but these matrices has only as non-zero again value, the non-zero again value of uh, L0, uh, the, the graph Laplacian, so it's n, n0 minus 1. And this has a nice interpretation. If you are a tree, you can prove that n1 is equal n0 minus 1. Okay? In a tree, the Betty number beta 1 is 0, and okay? you have no cycle. And if you start from a tree and you start adding edges, for each, add, 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 for each edge that you add, you add an independent cycle. So this is the Betty one. Okay, so we are going fast. So are there questions? Because here is a nice... Uh, so today, you said today we're looking at square matrices, then yeah. N1 and N0 should be the same, right? Sorry? N1 and N0 should be the same if we're looking at square matrices. No, N, N1 is, a, so this is a square matrix, N1 by N1. So this is a rectangular matrices that is N0 by N1, okay? This is another rectangular matrices that is N1 by N0. So this is a square matrix n1 by n1, and this is a square matrix that is n0 by n0. Okay? So out of a rectangular matrices, you either contract on one dimension or the other, so you get square matrices of either one dimension or the other. Okay? Are there any other questions? Or... So this is important, right? So what we were mentioning here is that one of these eigenvectors is zero, so all the others are non zero and are n zero minus one. And here you have n one eigenvalue, but since b one and, and, and n one and n zero are isospectral, the non zero one are only n zero minus one. So the zero eigenvalue will be n one minus. Okay. Or the other must be zero. Okay. Are, are there questions? Okay. Okay, so let me start introducing maybe we, we will have we will have a break soon, but I will have, I would like to uh, start to introduce the discussion about the other square matrix, that is the Dirac cooperator. Okay, because now the algebra version describes diffusion from n synthesis to n synthesis. You go one dimension down, one dimension up. But you don't mix the function defined on different synthesis. Okay, you, you go through one synthesis, but you don't mix co chain. Okay, so and in, in many situations, you might want actually to. We have an operator that treats topological signal of different dimension, and of course, one possibility could be the boundary operator. 
and we are getting close because the LIDAC operator is defined in terms of the boundary operator. But we want also square matrices. So we want an operator that really acts on what we want to assume is the dynamical state of a simple shell complex. And as you remember yesterday in the introduction slide, I, I mentioned that actually until now most of the approach in complexity in natural science associates a dynamical variable only to the node. This is epidemic or susceptible or infected, a spin on the node, an opinion. But actually, with this co-chain, we know that we can associate the dynamical variable also to the edges or to the triangle. And therefore, it, uh, it's really nice to think of a dynamical state of a simplicial complex as a topological, what I call topological spinner. And the, the term spinner is, 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 comes from the fact that the Dirac operator will act on it. And uh, so, so you define this topological spinner that we call capital C psi as something which is given is it lives in the space of the direct sum of cochain, all the cochain of your simplicial complex. And since now we are going up to dimension two, we have the direct sum of zero cochain, one cochain, and two cochain. And so, uh, so if you have n zero nodes n1 edges, n2 triangle, we can define n curly as n0 plus n1 plus n2. And this topological spinner can be represented as a vector of dimension n curly. Right? So you have your topological spinner, which is simply a vector whose block structure is here a vector defined on each node of your simplicial complex. Yeah, I use P because I like P for edges, but it's, it's not, this is capital, this is not capital, so I hope it's understandable. And then you have C, so these are the vector that represent the zero cochain on the basis of the node, a one cochain on the basis of the edges, and a two cochain on the basis of the triangle. So, you want me to write it as this? So, like, so, P will be P1, P2, P and 0, defined on each edges. Small c will be c of the first link, of the second link, and on the last link. And C will be actually defined on each triangle, C1, C2, C, and 2. Okay? So you have this object. And so another way to write C, capital is key, direct sum, C, small. Okay? And, me. yeah, all those things in the vectors, chi, epsilon, mm -hmm. they are the, they form the basis of C1, C2. Yes, C1. they are the basis. They are the co-chain eval evaluated on the basis of the synthesis. Okay. Um, and they, we can, we can associate a real value to them. Can try also to associate complex values. Okay. And on top of this topological spinner, the operator that will act 
is the Dirac operator. And the Dirac operator will map topological spinner to topological spinner. So you have a state of your superficial complex which will be mapped on a state of your superficial complex. Okay? But in doing that, you actually mix the signal on, on the node with the signal on the edges, the signal on the edges with the signal on the track. So maybe now we can stop and then we start and we devote our time to this. So we come back to the next step. Yeah. Yes, I mean, like, uh, still have a little bit. But the point is that 
and that the matter is representing the joint of that. In fact, is the the point is that uh, the spinners aren't hiding that. So you have these dark shirts. There's maybe. There are genres. Yeah, you 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 can just get them. Yeah, yeah, you can just get the general element. Then. You might have a, a when you translate uh, a private program and you want to find the state of the deal. Yeah, when this relation between Sigma shares the Onar and Sigma and Sigma, I mean, this is the same is that if you spread the term minus two, then the only thing supporting that is the only. The last Okay, but once you once you wrap up the projection, then yes, two x minus one z z i z i. Okay, if you have to and you have to commute this with something like z i x minus one z since you have, so in practice, uh, then the only supporting term, the only terms that have the same support are that the terms that you have to use. I mean, you have, you have still many terms, but uh, you have to use But uh, yes, but you mentioned, so, so they are, I mean, in the sense of that, they are less than the Then what you will do I still have to finish the. Uh, you have already the question. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, uh, because uh, the total is three, three pieces, three dollars, yeah. Then uh, so now we have to transfer and I think uh, two cancel out because we just did one, and the other one is the same, just uh, okay, maybe when we will set the yeah, yeah. 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 I should be something like uh, so once you have X, Y, because the I mean, uh, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting, ter I'm getting, I'm getting four body terms actually. Now, yes, I mean, it's, it's four body terms supported on both sides. Ah, no, okay, yeah, because you're, okay, yeah, yeah, because also, then you have also minus two, I minus two, and I plus uh, one, or uh, I minus uh, one, or I plus two. Basically, it's because, it's because you have uh, three, 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 yes, three, yes, three body terms, and uh, when you have it commuted, it's not that simple. Yeah, but you have the only one, 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 so you have the end one can, can, can the outside the the of this epidemic spreading. Is there an end in this epidemic yeah. spreading? They also are related to the and is keeping the epidemic spreading. Is there any connection between network and network? Like, can I can I define a paid variable no, and I can see the fluctuations around that and this space? Okay, the equation. Yeah. Yeah. Change the lattice. The easiest example is of the network is the lattice. 
Yeah, then they can. Anything in the but there's a real difference. Well, the price was the height, the tree, and the net. The way by which I can. You can say that the height is a little bit I don't know if you could say that there are three or one so that's the joint boundary, and the representation is some way that is just the boundary matrix. So, so the representation of the boundary matrix in the north is the boundary. The co-boundary operator is the boundary matrix M plus 1 and plus 4. If you do the adjoint, it's just B and okay. uh, one more question here in the watch decomposition. As I remember yesterday, you mentioned the, uh, the operator of uh, the boundary uh, operator of the boundary operator of M plus 1 and M is null, right? Yeah. So is it only one way? Like, why is this holding two? Yeah, because this is the adjoint. So this was so far. So if you if you do if you do This is also zero. And then you do two times. This is F and this is T. And you keep the okay. For any F and any G, this is zero. So you, you, you do that joint and then you do that joint another time. Zero for any F and any G, so this So that map topological spinner in topological spinner. And this is the Kira operator, which I 
provide you the expression uh, always for this two, in the matrix form for this two-dimensional um, for this two-dimensional Fischer complex. So we are So the Dirac operator so mapped topological spinner <coughs> in topological spinner and this is also defined as D plus D star or the adjoint. Uh, where D is the discrete derivative derivative acts on the topological spinner, it does the gradient of the node signal and the curve of the edge signal. Okay? So, um, so, uh, so this is the uh, derivative, the, the adjoint, Is of course here is still everything unweighted. It's this matrix, and so the Dirac is given by the sum of the two, and it's this beautiful operator. Star. Yeah, this 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 star work. Um, D is D one D one transpose zero D two D two transpose zero. Okay, so how the Dirac operator acts on on a topological spinner, so D applied to Chi, D top C, and C. So you have the Dirac operator acting on topological spinner, the kind of node edge triangle. So you take the node signal, you do the gradient, and you put it on the edge. See, you start to mix things. So the node signal, uh, so this is the node signal. The, the, the edge signal, you do the gradient, the, the divergence, and you put it on the node. And the edge signal, you can also do the circuitation and put it on the on the triangle and then triangle signal you do the adjoint of the curve and you put it on the edge. Okay. So you mix things up. Okay? So you do a kind of higher order derivative of your signal and you, you do all these operations together. Notice that these two parts, they sum together, 
but they remain distinguishable because one is a, a irrotational uh, part, so it's the gradient of something defined on the node, so it's an irrotational component of the edge signal of this object. And the other is a solidonial component because it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the adjunct of the curl of. So it's, it's, an oper it's, it's, a, it's a solidonial component. Okay? So this, these two parts, they sum up, but they remain quite distinct thanks to our decomposition because you can really uh, separate the two if you are given the sum with our decomposition. Okay, so the Dirac operator really mix up topological signal of different dimensions and make them cross talk. So if you want uh, to describe a dynamical process that mix node signal with edge signal, the Dirac operator is a good choice. Okay. And, and still it's, it's, it's square, so, so it couples topological signal. of different dimensions. That's very good. So let's start a little bit with uh, the property of this Dirac operator. You will see it's quite a nice and neat. So we just have them. I mean, I want to come back to your observation that uh, some of the middle component remain separate. Yeah. Can I see that because if I apply D twice, yeah. Actually, the first component does not feel the, the, the so B1, B2 of psi is actually vanishing. Yeah, exactly. That's the okay. yeah. So you can apply you can apply uh, B1 or you can apply B2 transpose. Yeah. And the other exactly. <laughs> Excellent observation. So, why is this operator called the Dirac operator? What does this have to do with the Dirac equation that we all love and like? So, of course, this textbook thing that Dirac proposed the Dirac equation because it wanted an equation for the wave function, which we wanted to have it a linear differential equation, was square would be the claim order equation. Okay, so in um, mathematics term, this means that the Dirac operator can be understood as the square root of the Laplace, and this is exactly what happens because the first property is that so the Dirac operator is the square root of the Laplacian, and here I, I, I write this, but of course we will need to understand what we mean by Laplacian here, and this will be clear, okay? Well, yeah, we will understand as Laplacian actually what we will call the gauss bonnet Which is, of course, very similar to the Laplacian we have introduced. But so let, let's see how to make sense of this. So what we want to do is Dirac square. Okay. So we have this matrix, and we want to do Dirac square. So let, let, let me just do step by step. So let me, for me, I quite used to that. You just do the matrix multiplication. And let's do this exercise together. So, row by column, first term here will be B1, B1 transpose. That's the graph of R. Okay. So, 
if you, you can convince yourself that the row second column and row third column this is all zero. So let's do the second coral by the first row. This is zero again. Here it becomes the, I think you do the second row by the second column and you have B1 transpose B1 plus B2, B2 transpose. So B1 transpose B1 plus B2, B2 transpose. What is this? L1. L1. And if you do the third thing, you get B2. So this is the gauss bonnet Laplacian. So this is L0, L1, L2. And of course, all these property they extend to any other dimension. Okay. So from this, we learn a lot of things. So, what is the dimension of the Dirac, uh, the kernel of the Dirac operator? You want to guess? Should be something that is in the kernel of L0. It's an eigenvector that is in the kernel of D should be either something defined only on nodes and in the kernel of L0. And these are back to zero again back, sir. Or something to define all your edges that is in the kernel of L1. And these are that you one. Or something defined only on triangle and in the kernel of L2. So is that clear? Because the zero eigenvalue that are the zero eigenvalue of D will be the zero eigenvalue of D squared. Okay? So you need to uh, to look at the degeneracy of the zero again value of this gauss bonnet equation, and this will be the sum of the matching number. Yeah. Okay. So let me just start. I, I see that this is not very clear. So uh, let me start with something easier. So we have that the alien value lambda of B are related to the value of this that I also call like this a curly by this is the a value of L kernel rule. So of course this square is equal lambda and L so the alien values should satisfy this relation. Okay? So what are the alien values of uh, the gauss bonnet Laplacian? Are of course the direct sum of all the alien values of the zero Laplacian, one Laplacian, and two Laplacian. And we notice something nice that since L1 is L1 up plus L1 down, right? So the the alien value of L are alien value of either Let's say L0 or L1, but the non zero again value, uh, 
e non zero eigenvalue of L are the eigenvalue of L0 the non zero eigenvalue of either L0 or due to the composition the non zero eigenvalue of L1 up or, or the non zero eigenvalue of L1 down or the non zero eigenvalue of L2 so we know that these are at the spectral though. So the, we have when we look at the at the eigenvalue of the Scouse Bonnet transition, we have at the non zero one, we have always at least the genesis of two. Okay? Yeah. Non zero eigenvalue here and non zero eigenvalue at least the genesis of two. Uh, even the general. general. Um, and so, uh, really, you can convince yourself that actually what happens for the Dirac operators is that A and value are plus minus square root. So, these two for the general C, one becomes plus square root of blue and the other becomes minus square root. And, they, and of course this is true this is true always. So this is of course relevant only for non-zero gain value and for zero gain value of course the, the zero gain value are, are, are the same and, and and the degeneracy, which is the sum of the degeneracy of the zero again value of zero, the zero again value of one, the zero again value of two. So we have another property that the dimension of the kernel of the Dirac operator is the sum of the Batinac. Because we know that the dimension, so dimension of the kernel of L0 plus dimension of the kernel of L1. So also in this, also this uh, Dirac operator is related to topology, of course, to this <coughs> harmonic Hegel vector. And the non-harmonic Hegel vector at this mm, this uh, they, they, they can be positive or negative, and this is also, of course, a property we, we observe from the application. Um, an important observation is what happens to this eigenvector, right? So, the eigenvector of positive and corresponding negative eigenvalue. And this leads to the formulation of a symmetry then in the Dirac operator, which is chirality. So, in order to show chirality, because this eigenvector will be related by a symmetry, so the one corresponding to plus square root of nu and the one corresponding to minus square root of nu will be related and related by chirality. <coughs> So in order to define QL, we need to define a matrix. Okay, all, here also we define it only for two simplices, but we can define on the question. You, we can define for also higher dimensional synthesis. And so this is the identity minus the identity and And if you are want to go higher dimension, you extend this and in the diagonal you have alternating sign of the, the sign of the identity. So what you can really check, probably I would suggest you to check at home because it's just a straightforward observation, is the anti-commutator of D and gamma zero is this zero. This is D gamma zero plus gamma zero D. This is here. Okay? Just do 
code of notification. Due to the fact that the Dirac operator has this structure that is non diagonal and particular, it's So you can, you can check. This is just straightforward. So, what is the consequence of this? Okay? Let's take a, a topological spinner, the capital, which is key, C small and C transpose. And this is a eigen vector of D with eigen value. Lambda different from zero. So we have D psi is equal to lambda psi. Okay. So we start with this hypothesis and we want to make a statement about gamma zero psi. You do gamma zero psi, which is of course key minus psi psi, and you want to know what is this, okay? And in order to show that, so what we want to show is that this is an alien vector. Of D with eigen value, of course, minus lambda. We want to find the symmetry between the eigen value, eigen, eigen vector of eigen value positive and negative. So this is simple proof. Just let me let me prove this. So D gamma zero psi. I can write as d gamma zero psi. Okay. I can use the anti-commutator relation. So d gamma zero is minus gamma zero d. Okay. And now psi capital always is an again back value vector of the Dirac operator with again value lambda. So this is minus lambda, and this is what we want. Okay? So if I act with the Dirac operator on this again vector, I get the minus lambda. So this is nice and neat, and this is nice uh, symmetry in this again vector of the Dirac operator. But you notice something. Do you notice something? Is that a catch? Is this valid for everybody? Is it catch? So zero probably you have to be yeah. careful about that. Zero. If you have like zero, yeah. this doesn't work anymore. So this is only valid. For non harmonic eigenvectors. Okay. So, and, and the harmonic eigenvectors, indeed, you can see here, they can be sitting only on nodes, only on edges, and only on triangles. So they might, and they might have, if, if you have something on the node, it might not be defined on the edge. Why, as we will see more, more explicitly uh, next, this uh, uh, eigenvector corresponding to non-zero eigenvalue, they must sit on two uh, on, um, on synthesis of two consecutive dimensions, either northern edges or edges in time. So this is a very nice thing because as uh, you know, when 
you look at the Dirac equation, this will imply that actually you don't have matter antimatter symmetry for harmonic eigen matter. Um, but we will do this later. So uh, another property is what is quite useful for this higher order Dirac operator because it actually decomposes the problem in something uh, smaller is what we call Dirac decomposition. So you have that D can be written as D1 plus D2 where D1 is only defined in terms of the boundary operator D1 and all your node and edges and D2 is defined only in terms of the boundary operator D2 so all your edges and triangle and why we will call this Dirac decomposition because you actually can show that d1, d2 is equal to 0. And you also show that d2 and d1 is equal to 0. So your space, if the topological spinner is defined on complex number, topological spinner function Topological spinner can be decomposed in a unique way in an image of the one, direct sum image of the two, direct sum kernel. So it means that the non zero eigenvector are either in the image of D1, so the final node and edges, or in the image of D2, the final edges and triangle. Um, so that, that's a nice idea. Mm -hmm. So let me <coughs> let me uh, discuss then separately this non-zero again vector of the one and non-zero again vector of the two. Let's let's look them on the face. So we can just work with one and the other is similar because the structure is similar. So we want to eigenvector of D1. Okay? So we want to consider D1 psi is equal lambda psi. Okay? So uh, yeah, we want Psi and C is equal lambda P psi and C. Okay. So we write this in a system of equation, and we have B one psi is equal lambda K, and then we have B one transpose K is equal lambda C. So now we can apply B1 transpose here. So we have B1 transpose B1 psi is equal lambda B1 transpose 
sun. Uh, no, sorry, this, sorry. This, is, this is psi. And then here you have zero is equal to lambda. Okay, so C is zero. Uh, so here you ask me B1 transpose, so B1 transpose B1 C is equal to lambda B1 C. <coughs> Uh, uh, B1 key, sorry. You, you act with B1 on the other side. So and then you read what is this B1 transpose key is lambda psi. So this is lambda square psi. So psi is an again vector of the one Laplace. One down. And if you do the same thing here, you act you, you act with D1, D1 transpose key is equal lambda B1 psi. You read from there is equal lambda psi. Where uh, cubes. So this is a zero cube. So P is the eigenvector of the graph of motion. C is an eigenvector of the L1 motion. Okay. So these are also either the right and left singular vector of the boundary operator. You can see it from here clearly. But we need to be careful. Okay. Because they are proportional to the right and left of the boundary operator, but we are allowed to put a minus on the right. So, um, so the structure of, of the eigenvector of the D1, so this is the matrix of the eigenvector of the D1. So we define this as a matrix P. So now we go back to know the names and triangle. Here we have the right eigenvector of the boundary, uh, right singular value of the boundary operator B1, and here or the eigenvector of the graph proportion. Here the left singular value of the one, zero. And this is associated to uh, positive singular value. So practically you have B1, U1 is equal lambda B1. This is a singular value equation for, for B1, okay? So you take U1 is equal to the singular value, B1 is equal to the singular value. But then you have also U1 minus B1, zero. This is associated to a value lambda positive. This is associated to a value lambda negative. Then you have the same 42, so something defined only on the edges, the singular value. Um, singular uh, eigenvector on the right and on the left associated to positive eigenvalue this is associated to negative eigenvalue and these are clearly associated to uh, related to chirality and then I have the harmonic mode right and the harmonic mode I can choose it as I want I don't have to satisfy chirality and a nice way to choose it is either the final node or the final edge or the final triangle. So I will have something U harmonic uh, zero 
you harmonic one and you harmonic two. And these are as many as the Betty zero, these are as many as the Betty one, and these are as many as the Betty two. So you see that there is this nice, beautiful symmetry, but only for the non-zero, uh, the eigenvector of the Dirac operator associated to the non-zero eigenvector. Okay, so this is nice time if you have question, comment, or things you want to clarify, or so this Dirac operator maps topological spinner in topological spinner. It has a nice connection with topology because the kernel, dimension of the kernel is associated to the Betty number. It's not anymore positive defined as we like and we really like the Laplacian that were positive defined, but the Dirac operator is the square root of this gauss bonnet Laplacian and we need to pay the cost that is not anymore positively defined. But we have this nice symmetry, right? So then we know that the positive eigenvector are related to the negative eigenvector by equality. And we know this, this interesting thing that actually this harmonic eigenvector really pop up as something different, right? It doesn't, do not need to satisfy this property. Sorry, it's not, so it is true that the harmonic Eigenvectors also occur in pairs, it's just that it's impossible to distinguish them, right? It's impossible to distinguish gamma, gamma naught, V, and gamma uh, and V. Well, they don't really uh, occur in pairs, also the degeneracy might not be even. But the argument that you gave on the board holds also in lambda equals zero, right? If, uh, if V is an eigenvector, also gamma naught V is an eigenvector, because of the anti commutator relation. Also, gamma naught V is in the kernel. Yeah, but it is still a zero eigenvector. It's an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. So there is a pair, but it's impossible to distinguish either one because they both have the same eigenvalue. So you can't make one. Yeah, but you see, if you have something defined only on the node, gamma zero psi is psi. Because you, you invert what is on the edge, but in the edge is zero. So it's the same again back. So it's true that if psi is an again vector of the data operator with again value zero, gamma zero psi is also an again vector. But it's not true that it's distinguishable. Yeah, it's not distinguishable. Uh, it is not distinguishable. Yeah. It's it's the same. <laughs> it's the same object, but it's a statement that doesn't make sense. So you see this. So let's say. Let's say you have a connected graph, right? You have a, you have a tree. You have a tree. So here, beta 0 is equal to 1, beta 1 is equal to 0. So of all these matrices, you only have something on the nodes, and you have only a constant vector on all the nodes. And there is, no, there is nothing here, there is nothing there. I see. So you don't have symmetry, right? Really, the degeneracy of the space is not even. Right. Might not be even. I understand. Okay. So, uh, what happens is that if you have a chain, right? If you have a chain, that's a nice and beautiful example. Because here, what is the Betty, Betty 0? One. one connected with one. And the Betty 1? One. one. So Betty 0 is equal to Betty 1, this is 1, and then OK. And indeed, if you exchange edge with the node, you have a kind of duality there. OK? But in general, this is OK. So let me mention an important thing. Um, I don't know if uh, probably we will uh, Maybe we can discuss also today, just a little bit. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I am uh, probably lo already lost in this notation, but I want to make a connection to ordinary Dirac equation. 
in ordinary Dirac equation, to have a chiral symmetry, you need to have even dimensional space time manifold because this chiral uh, matrix, gamma 5, is a product of uh, gamma matrices present in the equation. Okay, it must be even to have a uh, uh, you, can chiral, you can also define gamma phi. Yeah. So, so that you can define define uh, gamma phi as the projector on the posit um, positive uh, <laughs> alien state minus the projection on the negative alien state. And gamma phi you can define on. And how is it connected to the dimensionality of the for example, graph under, under consideration, on which this construction is done. Yeah, here uh, we are not on a lattice, so you need to, there, is, there are many, many different definitions, many of, definitions of the dimension yeah. in this object. But yeah, you, you, can, uh, you can write this also on, on lattice if you you need to be careful because this is not exactly like the Dirac Cobarito because uh, chirality here uh, might not be such, might, might not correspond to the same thing that, that is in the continuum because you have this big difference. So, an important thing because uh, this is question about the connection with the Dirac equation, so we want to go in that direction eventually now and tomorrow. So one important thing is that in the Dirac equation you have the spin. So you have the gamma matrices. So you couple in general the Dirac operator to an algebra. And so how do you see how can you see this here? Right? And And the way to see, the easiest way to see, is that you can define a Dirac cooperator as we did it. But you add something. So you add here a complex number and it's conjugate, and here another complex number and it's conjugate. As long as this number has absolute value one, so it's a phase. So why this is interesting? Because we want the Dirac operator to be the square root of the notation. And what happens is that this operator is also the square root of the Laplace for any phases p1 and p2. Because if I do this square, when I multiply this by this, I have p star p1. So this remainder change. So this is good as well as a Dirac operator, and I can work with any complex phase here. Right? And why is this interesting? Of course, going in the direction of Dirac, is that this can allow you to distinguish between different edges. So now, if, if you have a lattice, you go back to lattice, because if you have a lattice, right? Two dimensional lattice. Just draw a little bit. Okay? And this is a torus, let's say, with periodic boundary condition. But let's say that let's put this in a nice situation. But I want to distinguish between the direction of these edges. If one is in the S direction and the other is in the Y direction. And when I do the gradient, and when I do the divergence, I want to keep track that if I'm working on x or working on y. 
And the way to do that is to define um, so this boundary boundary um, uh, let, 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 let's see that let's five things and let's say that we have a Dirac only on the graph we can, this can be generalized also on, on for instance on, on cell complex if you are square but let's say you have only B1 and B1 transpose right? this is the Dirac on the graph okay and this is work as well if I hear a multiply complex number. Mm -hmm. This is the same as I mentioned. Okay? With absolute value. So now I want to adopt a B equal to 1 when I go on X edges. And a B equal to I when I go over Y edges. This way I can distinguish between the two directions. So in order to do that, I need to define a boundary operator, Bx. I, I omit the one because we are, we are only working on one. So Bx would be defined as one minus one and zero, and is one if L, uh, sorry, this is, between node i and node l. This is one if l is gray i and l is of type x is in the x direction and minus one if l is i j and l is also in the L direction and zero otherwise. So if I do the gradient, I do the gradient only on X wing, and if I do the diversion, so I do the diversion only taking account of, of the X wings. And I can do the same for one. Okay? And then I can define dx. Y very nice. Okay. So now when I do D square X, I have something that is the graph of operation only taking account of the X links. <coughs> so here I will have a L0x and here I will have L1 <coughs> down x, that is all it. And when I do dy square, this is going to be L0y, only taking into account y edges. Okay? So there are a few lessons to be learned with this. So if I want to go higher order with the lattice, higher dimension. So I want to go in three dimension, for instance. This is not enough. I don't have uh, some, uh, some degree of freedom to play with. So what I need to do is have a topological spinner that is formed by two zero crochet, two one crochet, right? And instead of multiply by complex number, I put a Pauli matrices, okay? And then the Pauli matrices, the independent one are, are, are three, and this, I can take care of three dimension, okay? And I want to mention something very nice that emerged from this. And what, um, already from this, but even more, uh, in three dimension, and the fact is that this Dirac 
operator you can really define a, a, as a derivative. So you do the gradient, you do the divergence, nice and neat. But this is a special type of derivative because this object is different from zero. And it's different from zero also on a lattice or also on a uh, lattice. And what, how I see this is, is in this way. So you have your, your square, right? And so let's see, I want to enter here the matrix element of this matrix, OK? So I'm in a node. I do the gradient, and I go to the edge, the x edge, with the Dirac x. Now I apply dy. dy is all in on 0 from y edges to node. So I have no way. This is zero. Okay. This is also zero because I, I just need to go from node to edges and from edge to node. What about this? So here I am from an edge. I do the gradient on the x direction and I go to a node. And now I apply the y. I do the gradient in the y direction and I on on y direction, so this matrix here is, is non-zero. And this is a nice object that has even four indices. Two indices are the x and the y, the one of the lattice, and two indices are the matrix element. Okay? Because this matrix will have non-zero element only among Lx and, and Yx. Okay. So I, I consider this as a good candidate, or almost good candidate for curvature. Okay. But of course, to, all, to define that, you need a coordinate system, right? Um, okay. Yeah, I think we can make it and discuss briefly the Dirac equation and then we, we will continue tomorrow uh, more extensively on that. So the Dirac equation without this uh, spin or this algebra, the, the simplest topological topological Dirac equation. Of course, you can do with the spinner, and this is actually business that uh, relates to where this data operator has been started to be understood with Kubasuski and the Stagger fermion. But I want to tell you about the easiest, the, the easiest way to look at the data operator. And so we, we call the data equation. So we consider so this is the partial derivative with respect to time. Now, psi is the topological spin, or it depends on time, is equal h psi, where this h is the Hamiltonian. This doesn't have to do with topology. And h, you take d plus m, the parameter, and then here you take a matrix that, because of History, we call it beta. It doesn't have anything to do with the beta empty number. So for us, beta is gamma zero, is what we call it. So of course, we have already mentioned that D gamma zero anti commute. And so if I want to consider the eigenstate, So, um, of energy E, this boils down to look at topological spinner satisfying this. So, this is E psi is equal to D plus M beta psi, or let me just say gamma zero. And 
and I, I do what I did at this, I square this, so e squared sine is equal and what I get is e squared This is zero. So psi is an eigenvector of the Dirac operator with eigenvalue lambda and the energy. So energy square is equal to lambda square plus n square. And uh, no, 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 sorry. No, uh, t is not a negative vector of negative value uh, lambda. Um, um, yeah, okay. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So you have the dispersion relation, but the eigenvector has a different structure because it doesn't satisfy any more parallelity. So we have a mass term. Uh, so the structure of the eigenvector of associated with the eigenvalue lambda here is something that is the singular value, the right singular value of the Dirac operator, and then the left singular value of the Dirac operator, if this is defined on northern edges. Okay? And here, here in the alien state of the Dirac operator, you only get plus or minus one. Right? Here you, you can have other positions. And maybe tomorrow I will tell you exactly the equation. But practically, the node component is proportional to the eigenvalue of the graph Laplacian. The edge component is proportional to the eigenvalue of the edge Laplacian. And here you, you can have plus or minus. Uh, no, uh, yeah, so uh, we add. Uh, yeah, I, I will tell you a little bit more about this structure. So. But in any case, from, from this view, start to see that this should be the dispersion. And, and what you will start to see is that actually uh, you have a symmetry. So for every uh, and uh, for any eigenvalue lambda greater than zero, you have a, an energy state that is lambda zero, and an energy state that is negative. So an energy solution that is not negative, but if lambda is equal to zero, you don't have this. So you don't have this symmetry. Yeah, the end of the lesson is a little bit like that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit tired. But uh, tomorrow we will go back to it and we will, uh, we will uh, define, uh, discuss again the Dirac equation. And, but uh, of course, I think that the Dirac operator is quite well understood for the moment. And, and it's probably, and then tomorrow we will build on that. And the plan is to do, introduce the matrix tomorrow. So, I hope that uh, so we will go back to these adjoint operations and introduce the metric and do some nice stuff. Okay, so let's thank Jessica.
ask questions now. I mean, if you are around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Allora, ho bisogno un attimo di lavorare, c'è un bel show.